So we will start at that point. If you will open your shoulders this time, keep your club face as square to the line as you can. Open your shoulders. That is correct. Your right shoulder is closer to me than your left. Okay, now swing the club. There it is. Correct correcting the draw, which is what Rick just was asking. You open your shoulders and everything else remains the same. Grip. So I was here, square. That's right, or slightly closed. Yeah. And now you've opened your shoulders, which is going to produce a slightly outside takeaway and then just your normal action all the way through. This is how you produce the fake. Now there are other ways, opening your stance, weakening your grip, but we don't really need to go into that at this level. You've experienced, other players have experienced this. At the highest level, once you open your shoulders, which produces a slightly over the top action, yeah. if you're not active with your hands, which he is not, you will not produce the left shot. And this was the way that Sam Sneed was able to stand in the same position that is and correct. hit fade or draw on demand was with the shoulders. That is correct. Which, which creates a different path through the ball. Is that, that is, correct? We're that talking is, about path here. That's correct. You do not adjust the club face alignment whatsoever. Another misconception. The club face stays square to the target line. You do not open the club face or weaken your grip. Just open your shoulders and swing. This will produce the fade. And there it is. Very nice. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, it's, it's fascinating. So, Now, I want to I wanna mention one thing. I've had the privilege of teaching many good players. One of them in particular had this tendency on a particular hole to lose the ball to the right. Okay? Now, I told him losing the ball to the right is not because of your alignment. What it is is you are not aware of what you're doing. The more that you open your shoulders, the more that you will hit the ball to the right. That's what people don't understand, okay? So I told him to close his shoulders, i.e. aim to the right where the trouble was and work the ball away from the trouble. There is a difference, I wanna state this clearly. There is a difference between misalignment when you're thinking that you're aiming down the fairway and you're actually aiming to the right by mistake as opposed to aiming to the right by design. Mm. No good player will aim to the right by design and hit the ball to the right. So these guys, you have to be aware of the body position, commit on that body position as it relates to the ball flight. That you is correct. To, you have to be 100% committed and sure of the body position, position. as well, it you relates have to, to the ball flight. And you have to understand the fundamentals of the golf swing. When you aim to the right, you're going to produce a club face or impact position that is closed to the target line in relation to your shoulders. Well, I think on a subconscious level, uh, if you're aimed to the right and you're not aware, That's, your mind will shut down that club face trying to get it back going to the left. That is correct. You know, and I know I've struggled with it myself that is in correct. the past when I wasn't aware. That is correct. You know? That so. is totally correct. All right. Okay. Uh, I want to talk to you now about the importance of shoulder turn as it, as it, uh, relates. it relates to uh, plane mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. arc. Okay. All right. Okay. I know that, I guess it was a few months ago, you had made a, you had seen a correction in me where I, again, was taking it too far inside and then you had me go outside, out, outside or it felt I, like I was going outside. Yes, sir. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, about that okay. plane action. Okay, what I would like you to do is to hit a couple of balls for me, please. Okay. Now, one thing all players should acknowledge is that if they're not working on something specific then they will return to their old habits. Okay, now his tendency, Rick's tendency, is to take the club a little too far to the inside too quickly, which is what we call narrows your arc. Now this time he's gonna make a concerted effort to get the club outside on the backswing. I want you to demonstrate without hitting the ball this time, please. Take the club, that's right. Set up to the ball, please, sir. Okay, now be very aware, 
Eric, if, if you'll get more in this position here, okay, so you can see the angle, that his takeaway is going to be much more vertical and much more outside. Okay, go up, all the way up. Notice how upright the shaft is now in relation to where he was before. Okay, get it, that's right. When he gets it inside too early, the, the club flattens. That is not good. Okay, take it, okay. This time he's gonna hit the ball, take it outside, and then, if you will, that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're after. Okay, the rolling of the club face is a result, not a cause. It is a result of the club going outside, which allows him to fully release the club. This releasing of the head. That's correct. Okay, that, that brings up a good point. Under no circumstance do you keep your head down. None. David Duval being the greatest proponent of that. Just let the head float with the body. You know, when I was able to incorporate this this plane of having a little higher arc, I felt that I could release the club head as hard as I wanted now. And believe it or not, I thought at first it was gonna cause me to come outside the end and hook the ball. That's correct. You know, but it didn't happen that way. That's correct. Because of the fact that of my particular skill level, my mind was able to overcome this tendency mm -hmm. and I was just simply able to move the club down the line without fear of hooking the ball. That, you know? And that relates back to what we said earlier. Everyone's swing is an individual swing. I analyzed what was wrong in Rick's swing and that's how you're, that's why I say it's important to have this team concept, which Rick totally subscribes to also. You cannot attain this level on your own. No, no, it takes a team. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, you're fine now. Just take it slightly outside and let it go. You can tell also, my, my teacher told me, you don't even have to watch the ball. All you have to do is listen. And you should be able to pick up through the sound of the impact, how square that club face is. Yeah, and I feel like I'm hitting it about 80%. percent i still got a little bit left in there, you know, but there's no need if I'm driving it 275 or 280 yards for a player like me in my mid to late 40s. Mm -hmm. If I'm getting ready to try to qualify for a Champions Tour event or even a nationwide event, mm -hmm. 280, 290 it's is sufficient. It's, it's pretty good. It's sufficient. I don't think 250 or no, is 260 it? is not going to do it, but I don't know of any touring pro that's hitting it 250 yards. And let's remember also that the long, the top long ball hitters on the tour are not your top money winners. Yeah. Okay. That's right. So right. it's your it's your your players that have, as I said, confidence through repetition. That is the mission statement. If you gain nothing else from this videotape, gain that confidence through repetition. The more that you do it the more confident you will be. The more times that you're in the finals or in the last group at a PGA event, the easier it will be. And I'll give you this little story right now. A friend of mine was participating in an event and did extremely well. And he was in a playoff with Freddie Couples. And he said, oh my God, Marty, I'm so nervous I can't even breathe. And I said to him, you have the advantage. And he said, how could that be? Freddie Couples being a top PGA player for many years, how could I have the advantage? They expect Freddie to win. Mm. And remember, you got here by your own merits. You didn't fall out of a, the sky and just end up in a playoff with Freddie Couples. So obviously you earned your stripes. Now go out there and do what you've been doing for 72 holes yep. and go win this tournament. Yeah. There is nothing to fear. And this is, if you will, the secret of many of the top players. Ben Hogan, Alan Doyle, which we will get into, they have no fear of who they're competing against. Yeah, it doesn't matter. That's right, it doesn't matter. It goes, it goes to the fact that they are pure thoroughbreds, which I will explain later how that fits into the story, but they are giving it all they have at every time. I wanna, I wanna touch base with you on this fear thing. I remember, you know, as a, as a, five handicap and the thing that kept me out of five handicap was I was racked 
with fear Absolutely. of hooking it out of bounds. I was just so fearful. And now I've got no fear of hitting it out of bounds, even though the club head is rotating mm -hmm. so quickly through impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you know what I'm talking yes, about? Yes, sir. Well, your other whys, which we've discussed, yeah. your other whys are so fundamentally sound, you cannot actually produce this shot. And if you do, this is the best part, if you do, there is, why. that's right, there is no problem. Let me say this to you. Tiger Woods in 2008, or excuse me, 2007, won the British Open. His first tee ball was out of bounds. Yeah. It, no fear. He corrected it. He went on to win the tournament. Yeah. yeah this yeah. is what I pass on to you if, if, I, if I can do anything else. If you have the confidence that you can fix it on the fly, see, there's another key phrase. On the fly, meaning we, we ain't got time to wait five holes or tomorrow. Yeah. You got to fix it right now. And, but you got to know how to fix it. Exactly, which is the wise. Yeah, which, which is, is the wise. You know, Absolutely. The last point on driver, of course, we're talking about alignment with the shoulder alignment. If I want to hit a fade on any hole, all I have to do is simply open your shoulders at address that is correct which if, which if i want to hit a draw I close close your address. shoulders that's right and that is because the mechanics the fundamental the uh kinesthetics if you will the mechanical function of the golf club mm -hmm. is such that no good player is going to aim to the right and hit it to the right no one it's like standing on the edge of a building and leaning forward that's not going to happen you're going to kill yourself Nobody will stand on the edge of a building, a 10-story building, and lean forward. It will not happen. So the same thing is happening with the golf swing. When you aim to the right consciously, that is a key phrase. You're doing it on purpose. You create right. the right to left spin. Or I could aim square and then set up shoulders closed. Well, there's no point in doing two things yeah, yeah, when you yeah. can do it in one step. Yes. And that's why, as we will discuss, your setup from behind the ball is integral. Well, okay, your pre-shot routine, which you've heard, okay, everyone's heard about it, is you come from the ball from behind. And so now you know what line that you're, you're choosing and you set up close to it and you create the ball flight that you wish. Unbelievable. That's as simple as it is, ladies and gentlemen. I got no fear zero because you have confidence yeah. Yeah. because you've done it yeah. confidence through repetition the more he does it that way the more confident he becomes that he can produce it which is exactly why tiger has got the advantage on all of us well the thing that we'll discuss later on is there's a million driving range pros uh there are uh, you go to every golf course in every city i dare say in the world and you'll see a driving range pro. It's Absolutely. nothing to do it right here. But if you can do it on the 18th tee box, right. when 25,000 people are around, right. that's, then you that, can execute. That's where your confidence, and you can't get that confidence if you've never done it. Yeah. And this, this also extends toward these pros that are playing with Tiger Woods on a daily basis. Why is it that they fail so miserably? Aaron Baddeley shot an 82 in the final round of the PGA playing with Tiger. I mean, he, he was in the final group of the day, so obviously he didn't shoot 82 before that. Yeah. He was not confident that he could produce the swing in Tiger's presence. And yet, Alan Doyle beat Tom Watson to win the U.S. Open Senior. in Kansas City. That's right. Now, because so, he had done it before. Well, apparently. Not, not necessarily in Kansas City, but he had competed against a player of Tom Watson's caliber, which we all know, which yep. we'll again describe as we go along. But when you have the confidence through repetition, meaning you've done it before, then you have a formula for success. It's like the chicken and the egg theory. <laughs> what comes first? The confidence <laughs> repetition. Well, okay. it, it is your mission statement. <laughs> that, 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 okay, that's as simply put as it is. And I will say at this point, I, I mentioned earlier, I train thoroughbreds. I consider my friend Rick to be a thoroughbred. I consider Alan Doyle, okay, many other top players to be thoroughbreds. Thoroughbreds, as you know, do not know that they are in third place. 
they are running as fast as they can, giving it every effort that they can. And if you come off the golf course, Rick, competing in any tournament, whether it be your club championship or the state open or the US open, and you've given it all you've got, you've got nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. And the top players know this. People like Zach Johnson and on and on, obviously the great ones. But uh, th this is what we're talking about. This is what's gonna take you where you wanna go. Do not, do not have any fear of failure. Just replace it with a work ethic that is second to none. And again, if you concentrate on the whys, which I'm giving you today, why does the ball fly right? Why does the ball do this? If you investigate and in integrate into your swing why your swing is doing what it is, you have nothing but a formula for that. I want to ask you something. Um, there was a blog that was written recently by a college player that I've been reading online, and he's playing in Australia or some something. I don't know where he is, but uh, this was a four-year All-American. He's on the mini tour now. Okay. He's missed a couple of cuts, and he said that he's missed a couple of cuts. All right. But he made a statement in his blog that he was just going to practice a couple of three hours. That it really didn't matter, you know, whether I mean he could stay out there and beat balls all day, and at this point it wouldn't matter. I want to ask you something. This was the opposite of the Ben Hogan school of thought. My question to you, and again, my question to him would be. If you don't feel the necessity to hit, I mean, you're a golf professional, you're a professional golfer. If you don't feel the necessity to continue to work on your game, then you must have hit 18 greens today, and yet you still missed the cut. That's correct. Why did you miss the cut? Why did you miss the cut? And yet you chose not to go hit balls. You wanted to go to the movies or whatever, and you want to hit balls for two or three hours after you missed the cut. It and, is, and blame it everything, and, bl and blame it all on the putting. That's right. You know. It is amazing, okay, what the mind can trick you to believe. Mm. It is amazing, okay. Any player that constantly reverts to excuses, it was too cold, the greens were too slow, yeah. it was too windy, this player is doomed, mm -hmm. okay. You've got to acknowledge that you've got to rise above this type of thinking. Okay, good players, I share this thought with you, good players do things that bad players will not do. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a work ethic, if it's hitting balls, if it's going seeking out a qualified instructor, you have to do what it takes to win. And this is what the top players do. And I think maybe that's part of the reason why there are so many players on the mini tour, on every, developmental tour in this world, I just don't know if they understand the work ethic. If if hitting balls was not that important and you missed the cut, then you must have hit 17 or 18 greens and then blame it on the putter. Well, you know, they're going to blame it on something. If you notice, most of your champions don't blame it on anything. I share this story with you. If you notice, whenever Tiger doesn't do well, which of course for everyone else is very well, yeah. when he finishes, say, 20th, okay, he always says he's working on something. He never says, well, the course was too, uh, too bumpy, the greens were too bumpy. Good yeah. players do not make these feeble excuses. They look for way, winners find ways to win, losers find ways to lose. There's a, there's a statement that I've heard on the PGA Tour. Trunk slammers. Trunk slammers <laughs> are people that they get upset for whatever reason that they had a bad day and they don't pay the price. Yeah. They stick their clubs into the trunk of their car and slam the trunk and say to hell with this, excuse my French, but they're not going to seek out the whys as to what it took to correct what their problem was. Yeah, yeah. Don't be a trunk slammer. If you are, you're doomed. There's no point in continuing this journey. Yeah. You've, you know, you've got to have this uh, insatiable desire to succeed, which we will discuss later about other players. Yeah, well, like I said, I, um, I think that knowing the whys and being able to fix it fast, I think I heard Hale Irwin say that first, the guy who fixes it first 
is going to be the winner. And of course, you know, look at Hal Irwin. Oh, absolutely. You know, look at absolutely. Hal Irwin. Hal Irwin's record was, is almost beyond belief. One year at the senior tour, he competed in like 20 tournaments. The lowest he finished in those 20 tournaments was like fifth. He won like seven or eight times. Just an incredible record. But Hale Orwin, of course, is not your norm. Let's acknowledge that, right? And a great competitor, mm -hmm. you know? And that is something that I cannot teach. No teacher can teach someone. Some people have that burning desire mm -hmm. to compete. Yeah. And, that's, and, and it happens not only in golf, but in every walk of life. You know, successful businessmen, successful uh, truck drivers, whatever walk of life, they just want to be the best that they can. They are the thoroughbreds of their profession. You want to touch base something on the shoulder turn again? Well, I would like to re-emphasize so that uh, our audience has the benefit of what it is. Okay, I want you to demonstrate for us, Rick, a fake shoulder turn because a lot of people don't know what that is. A fake shoulder turn is whereby the arms keep moving and the torso does not, does not load up. Okay, that is a fake shoulder turn right there. Very little movement in the hips. Look at the shaft. That's right. It's parallel. That's right. So you're faking it. Please start again, please. Okay, now watch, watch the function of the tricep and the pecs. Watch how they move together. See that? Did you see that? That's exactly what you're looking for. When the tricep and the pec move together, what we call connection, you will achieve the full shoulder turn. Take it all the way up, please. There you go, that's what's loaded. Now when they talk about your back to the target, that's what we're talking about. Because uh, you have to be very supple, okay? Not everyone is able to attain that. So there's your, that's what you're striving for with your shoulder turn. Keep your tricep and your pec totally connected, and there's your result. There's your result. Okay. Well, you know, there is one, there is, one exception to this well there are several exceptions however these players have overcome this and they've made a compensatory moves and we'll talk about it later right. with our friend alan doyle hopefully we can get an interview with him later on but when i interviewed alan at the outback one year i was able to take a picture and i'll show you all this picture alan's makes very little if any shoulder turn however there is only one Alan Doyle. <laughs> there is only one Dana Quigley kind of this player. This goes back to what we said early in this video, that there is no book answer. You have to acknowledge this player does it in a certain way. Now we need to maximize his performance with those parameters. That's as simply as I can put it yeah, right well, there. Well, I, I, I think again, Alan's desire obviously is so great he has such a burning desire uh, of, of an, commitment. An amazing story. Yeah, and so hopefully we'll be able to touch base with him. But for the most part, if you're a level one player within level three, you need to acknowledge, acknowledge what the your shoulder turn. That's right, and to and to work with your strengths, or whatever they may be. You know, Marty, there's a over. Gosh, I don't know how long the tour's been around, but ever since there's been a tour. Ever since there's been golf instruction, there's been theories. You know, this thing is working now, and this theory is now the hot thing, and on and on. So what I want to discuss with you that has always been interesting to me is the different theories. Let's first talk about the great Ben Hogan, right. the Hogan theory. You know, the initiation of the downswing by turning the hips right. to the left. And let's talk about where he came in. How did he come up with that? 